speak just on that topic. It is my honor and privilege to introduce former presidential candidate, Andrew Yeah! It's great to be back with you all. I'm back just in time. You all have had such an incredibly powerful role in American life for the last number of years. I experienced it when I was here four years ago. You had the chance to actually kick the tires on the people who are going to be the next president of the United States. And there are people who are now questioning New Hampshire's place in that role in our democracy. I personally think it's absurd that New Hampshire Democrats are being punished for holding a primary you all are required to hold by state law. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Now, even if you wanted to try and make a change, you couldn't because you don't control the state house. Joe Biden recently gave a speech on the importance of democracy. Unfortunately, democracy is not necessarily alive and well with the DNC either. You can see it here in New Hampshire. You can see it in Florida where they've canceled the primary. Boo. Boo. You can see it in North Carolina where they canceled their primary. Boo. Boo. And what they are angling for is a rematch between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. Boo. Hey guys, I gotta say, I'm an anyone but Trump guy. Yeah. Like running against that guy. And I endorsed and campaigned for Joe Biden four years ago. I think Joe Biden has been a substantial and accomplished president. He helped us turn the page from Trump. But I want to quote Joe Biden from four years ago. He said he was going to be a bridge to the next generation. And I think that's exactly what we need. What do you think, New Hampshire? We need a candidate who's actually going to take it to and beat Donald Trump in November. We need a candidate who actually will represent the ability of our democracy to revitalize and rejuvenate itself. We need a guy who is actually making the case here in New Hampshire. What we need in the White House is my friend, the next president of the United States, Dean Phillips. Come on, Dean. two people come to our events in this room. In fact, I was trying to serve coffee a couple weeks ago and nobody came. Uh-huh. That's why I love you all, New Hampshire. You ready for change? Yeah! You ready to, ready to be a country that has housing for everybody? Are you ready to be a country that ensures everybody has health care? How about education for all? How about reduced costs for fuel and food? And most of all, how about winning in November? Yeah! yeah! How about that? Let's bring it, everybody. i got to tell you, let me just start with a big thank you. You know, the last 90 days have been the most joyful, restorative, reinvigorating three months of my life. I have seen the practice of democracy in the Granite State. That isn't just the best practice in this country, but perhaps all around the world. And I want to thank you for showing this country how it works and why you are the first in the nation primary. And, you know, there's a little bit of a media narrative going around that young people aren't really engaged right now. How about the young people in the house? I love you all and give you all a round of applause because you know what? You're out there. You just need a campaign to get behind, right? Yeah. So, thank you. Thank you for showing this country how to do it. Thank you. Thank you for your belief in me. Thank you for recognizing that if we don't get our act together and start treating people with respect and decency and collegiality, we're in big trouble. Now, i got a story to tell you. I don't know if you know this. Last night there was a Donald Trump rally in New Hampshire, and it happened to be across the street from my rally. Now, my rallies are a little bit different. <laughs> surprise, surprise. But... But this rally, of course, had a mile-long 
a group of people waiting to get in, waiting in the cold. So you know what I did? What a leader should do. I went up and said hi. They're fellow Americans. I had 50 conversations with MAGA supporters, with Donald Trump supporters waiting in line last night, an extraordinarily diverse group of people who were the most hospitable, friendly, decent people to me you could possibly imagine. In fact, more so than many of the Democratic elected officials in this state. Yeah. How about that? My point is this, everybody. If you want to be the leader of the United States of America, you cannot and should not ever condemn 50% of this country. You should be walking and meeting them in line. You should be going to coffee shops and cafes and saying hello, getting to know each other, handshakes, high fives, and hugs. That's who I am. You ready for that kind of change? You're ready. You're ready to wake up. You're ready to wake up the morning after the November election and actually be excited. You ready for that? You ready to feel like I felt in 1980 when I watched the U.S. men's Olympic hockey team beat the Russians when they had no chance? In fact, they had less chance than I do to win this election. And I know you know what I'm talking about. I want to be the country that goes to the moon and people cannot believe it. I want to be the country that makes sure that everybody has a chance to succeed, that we raise the foundation, that we have the equality of opportunity. Democrats and Republicans have failed for way too long. And I think it's time for change. You ready for change? Yeah. You ready for a new generation? Yeah, you ready for a little bit of love, a little bit of respect, a little bit of decency? If you are, my goodness, my friends, this is not just about a primary in the state of New Hampshire tomorrow, a primary that our very party, the Democrats, have said is meaningless. You know what? I think it might be just the opposite. I think it might be the most meaningful election of my lifetime. What do you think, Matt? Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, Matt Coker. Hey, everybody. I'm so excited about this. I'm one of the representatives in the uh, New Hampshire State House, and I, I've been a couple months uh, w with the Dean team, and, you know, let's send a message to America that we want some change. Yeah! yeah. Matt's one of those people who had the courage to do what his party really hates and my party really hates, which is actually saying the quiet part out loud. I love you, man. Yeah. I love you. And we need people at the top of the ticket like me so we can actually create a wave around this country in November to help everybody get elected, down ballot, up ballot, all across the country. That's why I'm running for president. So I just want to say thank you again. Our party tried to disenfranchise you. Our party got a letter last week from your Secretary of State, a cease and desist for the unlawful suppression of voters. So what do I ask you to do tomorrow? Demonstrate that not only are you not suppressed, that you are ready to vote for change. And you know what's really going to bother them? Is if we outperform tomorrow and surprise the whole world. Who's going to do that? You going to do that? Yeah, we are. You're going to do that? You're going to do that? Because i got to tell you, it will be the story of the century. This little campaign that started just on October 27th, when I, over 35 years old, born in the United States of America, and I had a $1,000 check. I walked right into your state house in Concord. I handed it over. And I became a candidate for President of the United States, along with 19, 20 other people. Isn't that a beautiful thing? Yeah. They didn't charge me half a million dollars. They didn't put up roadblocks like half the states in this country do. You make it easy to practice democracy. So then they try to suppress you and say it's meaningless. They don't want you to vote tomorrow. But I would say, you know what? Let's do just the opposite. So I am making that proposition to you. If you have the courage, if you got the desire, and you want to be part of history, Literally leave a legacy for yourselves, for this country, and for the entire world that is watching us right now, horrified that we're going to have another Biden-Trump matchup and Trump is going to walk right back to that White House. You are the only people in the world that have the power to prevent that. Because the sad truth is, I respect the man, but Joe Biden is not able to beat Donald Trump in the next election. Every poll is showing it. His weakness is showing in his approval numbers. And we all know intuitively what is forthcoming. So you, my friends, not me, tomorrow all of you are the most important people in American history. So are you ready to stand up and be patriots like we talk about every day in our history books? Please! And if you're ready, I'm ready for you. I will be your president. I will be your friend. I will have you to the White House. Red and Blue America, Common Ground Dinners, demonstrating every day, morning, noon, and night. There is only one way to leave this country not as a Democrat or Republican, but as an American president who loves everybody. That's my invitation to you. I love you all. We're going to do this. We're going to shock the world. We're going to have some fun. We're going to get it done, and let's do it, my friends. High five. And with that, I'm actually someone who stands before you to answer your questions.
<laughs> so what is on your mind, everybody? Don Conrad's got the microphone. Okay, so you talked about this a little bit, but could you expand on your, like, border patrol immigration stance? Because we've seen a lot of change in the last eight years with it. So what are you looking to do? So what I'm looking to do is be a president that actually does what we're supposed to, which is to ensure that we have security on our borders. We spend a trillion dollars a year. Do you all know that? Almost a trillion dollars a year on our Pentagon budget, $866 billion to be exact. It is the foremost responsibility of a president to keep our safe and to keep our borders secure. Right now, you all know the truth. I shouldn't be the only Democrat telling you that we have a crisis at the southern border, but I'm going to because I've been there twice. I've seen with my own eyes human beings in cages when I first went down. I've seen thousands of people coming across the border, many of them with babies, all of them wanting the same thing that many of our forefathers and foremothers wanted, just like mine, just a chance to be safe and secure and pursue the American dream. But that is not an excuse for the fact that anybody is walking across the border, many of them not encountered, and walking off into wherever they want to go. That is the opposite of border security. And the president, as you all know, authorized attacks on the Houthis in Yemen recently, and he had that authority. He did not even have to go to Congress to do it. The president of the United States has the authority to protect us at the border. He hasn't done so. Presidents before him haven't done so. Donald Trump's atrocious border wall is being dug under, walked through, and gone over right now. We have to redo our entire border security with barriers, with the technologies, completely reinvent and rebuild our ports of entry, which are archaic and absurd. We need a buffer zone on both the Mexican and U.S. side of the border. And here's the best solution. Upstream, the real problem is our asylum law. We are forcing people to save $10,000 to make this arduous journey up through Mexico to the Rio Grande, handing those $10,000 of their savings over to a Mexican cartel, only to be dumped on our side, processed by our border patrol, then brought to El Paso with no money, most not speaking the language, not, no ability to work, and many of them now getting bused to cities like New York and Chicago that have no resources to care for them. And I've not seen any action by our Congress, despite our efforts to try, and the president to try to prevent this. How do we change it? It's actually really simple, everybody. This is called common sense. We should change our laws so that asylum seekers file their claims in their country of origin, wherever you're coming from. We can keep people safe and build dorms near our uh, consulates or embassies. You file your claim. We adjudicate it locally, where we actually have people can understand if it's a legitimate claim. If you are, if it's a legitimate claim, we bring you to the U.S. with your own $10,000 in your pocket so you can start your new life in America with a little bit of cash, the right to work, and the ability to achieve the American dream. It's not that hard. I don't know about all of you. Are you ready for a little bit of common sense? To be humane and decent and welcoming? That's what the country is all about. My Republican colleagues agree. My Democratic colleagues agree. But we've got leadership right now that is so focused on fighting one another that we've totally stopped fighting for each other. I want to be both. Two things can be true at once, humane immigration and border security, and I want to get it done. Thank you. So, first of all, Congressman, I'd like to thank you. And if you say your name, too, I'd love oh, to know your name. Yeah, my name's Nick. Hey, Nick. Nick. Nice so, I'd like to thank you, first of all, for getting involved in this. Thank you. I think it's important to have an open democratic, democratic process. However, I have to admit some concern. Sure. Only a month ago, you came out with your support for Medicare for All, something we now see on quite a few signs here. Despite that, you still say that you have issues with getting rid of private insurance, something which is the backbone of Medicare for All. With that, in conjunction with the fact that your voting record is nearly unanimous with Joe Biden's stated positions, how can we trust that you're going to deliver on what you're promising, and how can we trust that you're going to win this and then be able to deliver on that. Okay, well, let's start with Medicare for All. So, from the day, first I, I was the board chair of a health system, in, and I appreciate your question. I was the board chair of a health system in Minnesota. I really do understand the deficiencies in our care system, which, by the way, we don't have health care. We have sick care. We have a system that only rewards hospitals for doing procedures. And then those procedures are all codes that have to be submitted to an insurance company, which can either approve them or deny them. How many in this room have had something denied by an insurance company? Huh. You see what I'm talking about? That's how this horrible system works right now. People getting surprise bills, 
66% of all bankruptcies in America right now because of medical debt. And that's how this horrible system works. I've seen it firsthand from the delivery of care perspective. Now look at Medicare for all as a concept has been demeaned by the right as something that would be a socialized takeover of health care. And I'm here to tell you that the only way actually to reduce costs of health care is to ensure we have a national health insurance system. I've always been in favor of the public option, which is to ensure it exists. And I was one of the earliest supporters of a bill that would allow any state to get a waiver from the federal government to actually test a Medicare for all program. Uh, I was going to do this actually many, many months ago, but I had some problems with the bill itself. And I've worked with Pramila Jaipal through those. And the truth of the matter is when I'm president, first of all, we've got to bring conservatives along. And I've done a Common Ground series in Minnesota where I've heard from Republicans that have raised their hands to that question and despise the health insurance companies, hate the surprise billings, cannot believe we don't have mental and emotional health care, can't understand why they can't get insurance, and when they do, they have to pay so much. This is not just an issue of the left. This is a, an American issue. The reason I'm doing it now is because I've spent 90 days here talking to people, listening to some of the worst horrifying stories I've ever heard. When I was in Minnesota, I represented a district that was quite prosperous in the suburbs where almost everybody had health care. Boy, what I've discovered because of all of you welcoming me here, homeless people sleeping in Veterans Park, veterans sleeping, right? People without health care, seniors who have literally have to make cold cereal for the last three days of the, of the month because their Social Security benefits run out. Look, at, I'm a leader who tells you I do not have all the answers. I'm also a leader who will tell you that sometimes when I discover something new, I will change my mind. There's nothing wrong with changing your mind. Why do we demean people? Why do we hold politicians so accountable for the rigidity of ideology rather than the capacity to listen, to learn, and to better understand? So, so I'll, make this, I'll just wrap this up really quick. National health insurance will allow us to do two really important things. Make sure that every American is covered. 25 million have no coverage at all. We allow, when I'm president, I will use every lever available to ensure that no pharma company in the world can sell their products in our country for one penny more than they do to Canada, Mexico, Spain, Germany, France, Australia, Japan. You get the idea. Do you know how much money that would save us? Because we pay 100% more than those countries right now. That would save us $250 billion a year. Then you add the health insurance profits. One of them, by the way, based in my district in Minnesota, United Health, that's about $300 billion a year. Since, health since right now we spend $12,000 per person, every one of those 25 million people who lack coverage would literally get it with the money already in the system if we simply reallocate it. That's how I'm going to get it done. And I'll tell you, when my conservative friends hear my proposition, the ones that I work with to make me the number two most bipartisan member of Congress, rest assured, we might just surprise everybody. Because you know what? Their constituents are just as disappointed and disgusted by what's happening right now, many of them in rural areas where they have no hospitals because they're closing. I make the promise to you. And by the way, there's a lot more I'm going to learn over the coming weeks, months, and years. And if I discover information that changes my mind, I will let you know. And that's how I'm going to do it. And I would ask that you share your ideas with me. By the way, I love you guys. This is so, this is so cool. How about that? Yeah, right. and just your name. My name's Beth. Hey, Beth, nice to see you. Nice to see you again. Um, I have a, a, a little concern that I'd like you to elaborate Please. on. I was I was getting some news feeds today, mm -hmm. and I saw an article uh, where the the topic of no labels was discussed. Sure. Um, you know, so obviously you're a Democratic candidate right now. Right. If you should become a no labels candidate, then we would basically have two Democrats running to share that piece of the pie, and then this other guy over here all by himself yeah. getting his piece of pie to himself. Yeah. Could you elaborate on that, please? Yes, I'm glad you asked that question so I can clarify this. Let me tell you this. I hope you know my backstory. You know, I lost my dad in Vietnam when I was just six months old. He achieved his opportunity to go to college that he couldn't afford from an ROTC scholarship. Um, went to Vietnam. He was killed just three days after the moon landing in 1969. My mom was 24 and widowed. We had nowhere to live, so we stayed with my great-grandparents for three years. And then I got lucky. I got really lucky. My mom remarried. I was adopted into a new family by a new dad. And I got so lucky that I've lived every day of my life since then, recognizing that it shouldn't take just a stroke of luck or being born in the right zip code to achieve success in the United States of America. It's a responsibility of people like me to pay it forward and to do better. And I got lucky, and I recognized that. 
And in 2016, I'm watching the election with my family in Minnesota. Remember that night? Yeah. I don't want to remember it either, but I better, I'm telling you, if Joe Biden's at the top of the ticket, you're going to be remembering that sadly again this November. And I mean this sincerely. I was watching that election. I had a wonderful life in Minnesota. I had a business I was trying to build. And I was so horrified by the outcome. Waking up the next morning to the sound of my daughter crying in her bedroom, 16 years old. She just overcome Hodgkin's lymphoma. She's a gay woman. I didn't know that at the time. And I saw fear in her eyes that I cannot even tell you how it jarred me, how it so deeply affected me, and so immediately. I sat at the breakfast table that morning, and I promised my two daughters I would do something. All of you who are parents in this room, you know that feeling. You reach that moment where you have got to do something for your children and for all the children in this world. And I said, I'm going to run for Congress. And I flipped a district that had been red for 60 years. I beat a man who had won by 14 points that night. The only reason I did that is to resist Donald Trump. Okay? When I get to Congress and I'm trapped in the House chamber on January 6th, one of 20 people up in the gallery when most people on the floor got out, when we had to hide behind the seats, when we had to put on our gas masks, and the security, the couple of officers that were in there with us said, find anything you can to defend yourselves, you know what we could find? Pens and pencils. To be sitting with 20 colleagues in tears, many of them calling home and texting home to say goodbye to their families, to hear a few of them in prayer, was something I will never forget my whole life. I'm sitting there thinking that our president inspired that. And when we finally escaped, ran across the hall, saw all the rioters on their, with faces down on the, on the cold marble, with long guns from the officers pointed at them, when we heard the gunshot that killed Ashley Babbitt, when we ran down the hallway to the safe room across the street, I'm sitting in a small room with 20 of my colleagues, half Democrats, half Republicans, standing next to Liz Cheney, to whom I probably never said a word before. And we sat there and watched this screen for two hours or so, waiting for our president to freaking do something. And he didn't. And when he finally came on the screen, Liz Cheney explained, it's because of him and we're going to hold him accountable. And I share this with you. I share this with you because that was the only time in my service in the United States Congress that Democrats and Republicans with whom I was gathered all felt like Americans. We all applauded, we hugged each other, and we resolved to get back in that chamber that night to do something because of that man. I also had one other thing that happened that night. Uh, when, the, when the doors slammed and the alarms went on and we had our masks on, my first reaction was to my colleagues, my Democratic colleagues, to join me. Let's go to the other side, the Republican side, so we could blend in. I believed, we all believed, that they were coming for us, the Democrats. And that if we could simply go to the other side of the chamber where the Republican side was, that they would just, we'd blend in and they wouldn't mistake us for Republicans. And I looked at my colleagues, a few of whom were in dismay because they were members of color and they could not blend in. And at January 6th means a lot to all of us because it was one of the worst days in our country's history, especially for those of you watching on TV and not believing what was happening. For me, it had another meaning. It was a day where I really discovered privilege in a way I never could have or would have but for that moment. My colleagues of color wondering if they should keep this little pin on so Capitol Police could make sure they knew that they were a member of Congress. But if they left them on, the rioters would know that they are members of Congress. So I'm, I'm telling you this because that day was so destructive but also so illuminating to me. And our president, Donald Trump at that time, inspired that horrible day. Hundreds of people are now sitting in jail or prison, and he's not. They followed their president. They believed in their president. And he walks the streets, and he right now is beating Joe Biden. So for anyone who says I would do something to help this man get back to the White House, you either do not know me or do not know my story or do not know who I am. I would not be standing before you dedicating my whole life, my time, my treasure, everything I got, to defeating this horrible, horrible human being. So, to, this, to the root of your question, no labels. I am a Democrat. I've been a Democrat my whole life since my grandma, Dear Abby, anointed me one at dinner in downtown Minneapolis in 1980. I have invested in this party. 
I have supported candidates. I've had President Biden to my home for fundraisers. I have done everything humanly possible to ensure that we become a country that treats everybody equally like our Constitution promises. I promise you I will continue to do that. The reason I'm running as the only Democrat willing to say the quiet part out loud is because I see Donald Trump coming back to the White House because Joe Biden should not have run for president again. And nobody had the courage to do what's necessary. I mark my words. I will do nothing to help that man. No labels, whether you love them or hate them. Let me just make a simple proposition to you. If, for some reason, we don't succeed and I become the nominee, and it is Joe Biden versus Donald Trump, Trump is going to win. And the only thing left, the only chance left that we have is a group like No Labels who could put someone at the top of the ticket who could draw votes from Donald Trump. I will not be that person because I will not draw votes from Donald Trump. Nobody like me, Joe Manchin, no uh, Larry Hogan, no John Huntsman, no Nikki Haley, no reasonable moderate center-right, center-left person could ever be that person. The only people that could do it are someone like Ron DeSantis, right? Ravek Ramaswamy. Some people, no, and I, it's not a joke. These are people who would draw votes from Trump. Do not demean a no-labels group that is waiting to see what happens and is maybe the very last bastion to save us. But you know who's orchestrating this nonsense? The Democratic National Committee. It is organized. It is intentional. Because they are so... It is a cult of personality around Joe Biden, everybody, that is so destructive. It is the same thing going on with Donald Trump. I will not be the no-labels candidate. There is no scenario where that would make any sense. I will not be on a ticket with Ramaswamy or DeSantis, for God's sakes. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you that we should keep our hearts and minds open to what could be the very last possibility to defeat him. Because I am convinced that Joe Biden cannot. So that's as clear and forthright and honest as I can possibly be. I'm a Democrat. I intend to stay a Democrat. I intend to win this nomination. And I intend to do anything, as I hope all of you will do, to protect this country in the absence of people in Congress right now unwilling to do their jobs. All right. Please, where, oh. and we got to let's get people in the back too. Hi, Mr. Phillips. My name is Chris. Only Dean, Chris. All right, Dean. <laughs> now I'm new to Team Dean. And uh, Open Secrets reports that you receive zero dollars in PAC funding. While I firmly stand behind PAC funding in our elections, I wouldn't be able to blame you if you did start accepting that because you're a grassroots candidate and you need to gain a platform. Do you have a plan for campaign finance reform in light of cases like Citizens United? Yes, good question. You know, what makes me rather unique is that I'm the only one out of 535 members of Congress who don't just take PAC money. By the way, no PAC money, no corporate or otherwise. I don't take lobbyist money. I don't give money to fellow members of Congress or accept it from them because that's just money laundering. And for, fifth, I don't have a leadership pack, which is a really disgusting slush fund for politicians. I'm the only one out of 535 people that can say that to you, and it's true. My colleagues are spending, my, my colleague, people in Congress are spending 10,000 hours per week raising money, every single week collectively. It's hard to find someone to go to dinner with on a Wednesday night in Washington because they're all going to PAC events and I have nothing to do. No. It's sad. <laughs> well, I get to catch up on Netflix and whatnot. <laughs> but here's the thing, everybody, and this is the root of why we're in this position. Every Democrat and Republican spending all this time raising money, who do they raise it from? The wealthy and the well-connected. They're going to country clubs and steakhouses and corporate boardrooms, gathering in luxury surroundings, collecting their PAC checks, their lobbyist checks. Not only that, my friends, we have legalized corruption to a point where members of Congress can take that $5,000 check and then sit the next day in their seats on a committee with the person who gave the money in the audience staring them in the eye when they're actually making legislation to regulate their industry. How freaking sickening is that? Yeah, so my proposition is this. We need a constitutional amendment relative to campaign finance. Citizens United was a horrifying decision. The sad truth is every campaign in this country, congressional and now certainly presidential, almost outsources its marketing to super PACs. I'm not going to enter a fight with one hand tied behind my back. If a super PAC starts that is ostensibly there to support the effort of this campaign, I can't coordinate with them. I can't know what they're doing. I never will. But I'm not going to enter this as someone who cannot compete. Joe Biden is the biggest recipient of PAC money, I think, in history. 
He's got more billionaires supporting his campaign than I ever would. So let's be honest, everybody. This is BS. And I think we got to expose the truth. I think we need to shine light on it and be transparent and let everybody know it's the reason we have Trumpism is because all of my colleagues are spending time with the wealthy and well-connected. And everybody I saw online last night at that Trump rally, they're just angry. They're not being heard. They're not being seen. They're not being appreciated. They're not being approached. They're not even having a chance to get a word in. And people get into Washington, they get sucked up by it. Why do you think people sit there for 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years? Why do you think people who are otherwise principled stick around too long? Like Ruth Bader Ginsburg, like Dianne Feinstein, like Mitch, well, I'm not going to say he's a, how about Joe Biden? <laughs> 50 years. You get caught up in this and you lose sight of what's really going on. That's why this has been the most amazing experience of my life. So help me do this. Let's get the money out of politics. Let's return to the days when Ronald Reagan won the presidency with public dollars because he didn't have to shill and raise money and, and be a grifter and, and, and beg. That's not what presidents should do. It's embarrassing. That's why I want all of you to help me. Five dollars, ten dollars, right? That's the more meaningful investment in this campaign than anything you could imagine. That's why I start my days calling the five and ten dollar donors because those are the best calls of my whole day. They pick up the phone. I'm like, this is Dean Phillips. I want to talk to you. And there's always silence. <laughs> and then they ask if this is a bot. <laughs> and then I have to, like, give them my mother's maiden name and my birthday. And like, and, but this happens all the time because, you know why? They don't even think this is real, that someone could call them just to say thank you. So thanks for asking the question, Chris. To all of you who care about this, just help me expose the truth of why we're in this predicament. Reduce the need for money. Do it like other countries who are seemingly doing it better than we, with shorter campaigns, uh, you know, caps on what can be spent, and, and this nonsensical way of financing campaigns that is as destructive to democracy as anything you could imagine. Hey, Walter. Hi, how you doing? I uh, checked out your website on uh, climate change since that's the single most important issue. And frankly, anyone here is under 50 for whom it isn't. Uh, it's better read a little more. But uh, so I was very happy to see that uh, you support carbon pricing, yes. which is the single most effective policy. Yes. Um, the IPCC report mentions climate uh, carbon pricing over 400 times in their latest report on how to actually cut emissions. Um, and, and even more, uh, even better, you support carbon fee and dividend, uh, which is the fairest uh, and most efficient way to do it. And it's also the one that might actually get some people on the other side of the aisle to exactly. do it because it, it doesn't have the government keep the revenues from the carbon fee, which will be a lot of money over time, but instead it pays it back to American households. And, you know, if you live in a small apartment in Manchester and you take city buses, you're going to get back a lot more than Bingo. you put in. Uh, if you have a Learjet uh, and, you know, <laughs> and fly to the coast every weekend, uh, you're going to pay in a lot more, um, and so uh, a lot of people, progressives, are kind of against market. The market, they think that's what's caused the problem, but it's really the failure to address this market failure that's caused climate change, and it's not just the United States, it's China, Iran, any country, whatever. So uh, really, really glad. I, I wish you'd you. talk about it more, yep. And um, but keep in mind that the people on the other side the, the Trump pretends it doesn't exist. I don't really think he believes that. Yeah. Um, and Nikki Haley says uh, the market will solve it. Well, yeah. the market cannot solve a market failure. The I market agree. failure being, of course, uh, when I fill up my car with gas, I'm happy. ExxonMobil's happy. But anyone in this room, uh, and people are going to be in around two, three hundred years from so now. Can I do, do have, so is there, It's yeah. a wonderful. Do you have a question in there too? Or well, no? I just, I just, okay. why, why, don't, why don't you talk about yeah. it more often? Thank you. And yeah. by the way, thank you for giving the most brief and succinct. Yeah. No, seriously, the, like the best explanation of what we need to do that I've heard from anybody in Congress. I mean it. You guys, you know. This is the live free or die state. This is not a country that takes well to mandates. We like incentives or disincentives, and that's what carbon fee and dividend is. We put a disincentive on the use of fossil fuels. And by the way, if we're a country that is so reliant on fossil fuels, that is one of the worst national security failures you could possibly imagine. We are enriching Iran. We are enriching Russia. We're enriching the Saudis right now. 
And, you know, we didn't leave the Stone Age because we ran out of rocks. <laughs> we came up with better ways to do things. We know what they are. You know, we have incentive programs. We Now, wind is the least expensive form of electricity generation. So, guys, this is not that hard. And, by the way, I want to celebrate John Curtis, my Republican colleague from Utah, the chair of the Republican Climate Caucus in, in, in the House. Benji Backer, a young Republican who has made his life mission the education and inspiration of young conservatives to actually get on board with this before it's too late. But I'm going to keep bringing a lot of this back to the simple truth that Donald Trump is going to march right back to that White House if Joe Biden's at the top of the ticket. So when you all leave here tonight, do me a favor. Please call 10 people before tomorrow and encourage them to give me a chance because I will do this because I know how to work with the conservatives that actually invented that very proposition. And you're right, progressives better get on board because the market needs a disincentive and incentive to moderate itself. And that's the only solution. And we also have to embed it in our foreign policy. And if we are going to enrich countries all around the world with hundreds of billions of dollars of our largesse, do you not think that we should have some standards for climate action for those dollars that we share with other countries? I think we should. It's the only thing we're going to do to provide an incentive to them to help us preserve the future. By the way, let's call it pollution. Republicans don't like pollution. Democrats don't like pollution. Earth is going to survive. The question is, will the human race? Let's do something to ensure it does, and let's not turn it over to men in their 80s who will not even be around to see that future, but to a generation that will be living it. Thank you. You said that you won't be seeking re-election. Oh, I'm, yeah. I'm sorry, sorry. You said yeah. that you won't be seeking re-election this year, and you right. just committed to not taking the no labels bid. What's next for you if you fail to secure the nomination? I'm going to help one of you run for Congress, run for City Council, run for School Board. I'm serious, everybody. We are on a we have a crisis of participation, and I'm going to dedicate myself somehow, some way, to doing what we need to do, which is to inspire people to recognize how lucky we are and our responsibility to ensure we pay it forward and to rectify the injustices of the past and to do something to build bridges to one another instead of divide from one another. That's what I'm going to do. Now, look, at my career could come to an end in November, and if it does, I gave it my best. I stood up when nobody else would. It could go on for four years. It could go on for eight but I'm here to give you the oath that I will not go on, before, on uh, longer than that. <laughs> Unlike somebody else running right now. That's the truth. And I want to help all of you who have aspirations to serve this country in some capacity. I want to be your mentor. I want to be your friend. I want to help inspire you because, my goodness, I've got daughters in their 20s right now, many of you in this room the same age. I have that responsibility to them, to you, my What is your name? Adozi. Adozi, thank you. That's my responsibility. I did give up my career in Congress. I knew I could have stayed around there probably just as long as some of the people I've mentioned before. But I don't think that's in this country's best interest. I think we need term limits, in fact, 18 years in the House and Senate and 18 years on the Supreme Court. For two reasons, because we need independent-minded independent minded thinkers, and we need to clear some space so people from your generation can participate. Every one of these people I've talked about, even good people, they have prevented sometimes three generations of leaders from even having a chance to run for office because they just think it's so important for them to stick around. It's wrong. I'm going to help in some way or another. But I think something's telling me, something's telling me we might be doing this for at least four years. <laughs> That's my obligation. <laughs> All right. In the back. This is our last question. That means we have one more. Hey, Conrad. <laughs> that means... We have this little shtick, you see. <laughs> he plays bad cop, I play good cop. We have two questions. So, uh, hi, uh, my name is Roy. Uh, hey, Roy. I was town captain for Barack Obama in 2008, oh, wow. um, oh. and it was great, great experience. Hey, I've been thank involved you. for a very long time. First day of Congress, Mitch McConnell promised to make him a one-term president, uh -huh. right? And that's the way Congress has behaved uh -huh. for the last 16 years. It was It's purely oppositional getting very little done. We have a college football coach preventing hundreds of military yeah. appointments. Yeah. How does that change whether you are in the Congress or president? Great question. And I'll answer it in a way that I don't think any politician who spent their life doing it 
could ever answer because they are brought up in a culture in which there is only one strategy, to defeat the other side every two years. They get so caught up in that that they completely lose sight about actually solving problems. So when a few of us come to the Congress, like me, who come from a business background, a background which I've never succeeded by demeaning 50% of my customers before, you see. I've only succeeded by extending invitation, getting to know them, understanding what matters. I, if you could see my cell phone right now and see how many of my Republican colleagues have sent me beautiful notes of support in the last number of weeks, sure. just saying, you know what, thanks for the courage. Miss you, man. You know, hope it's going well. They're being tough on you. You know, I, I, I'm saying this because we are a human enterprise, just like we are a, full, a room full of humans. I lead differently than any president in recent memory because I do not come at this with a political lens. And I'm going to tell you a story in just a moment that will very much illuminate how I intend to lead. Now, granted, politicians make promises all the time. Here's what I'm going to do. Well, I'm telling you, I'm coming from the place that makes it impossible to do right now. Not because there's a system preventing it, but because there are leaders preventing it. And some of the people that have texted me in the last number of weeks would actually really surprise you. Some of them, I think, are actually kind of pulling for me. They don't want Donald Trump. Now, in front of the cameras, they say they do. They actually want to solve problems. They are desperate to help their constituents. And I think we can do something really different here if you give me a chance. So we know what the status quo can be, but are you ready for a little bit of courage to think about what the future could be? And I can't make the promise we can achieve all these things, but I can make the promise I am sure as heck going to try. I'm going to have people there at the takeoff, so they'll be there at the landing. That's how I'm going to leave. And I'm going to tell you the truth, and I'm going to make it count, and I'm not ever, ever going to stop trying to get work done, and I will expose those who are standing in the way, and believe me, I'm going to do it with love. And that's the difference between vinegar and honey. And watch me try. I'm telling you, it's going to work. All right. One more question in the back, and then I'm going to tell you a story, and then I'm going to ask a favor of all of you. Good evening, Mr. Claus. My, oh, hey. Got it. Tell me Dean. Okay, okay, sorry. Good evening, Dean. My name is Vic Mahendru. Hey, I'm Vic. from Manchester West High School. Yeah, yeah. And this may not be a hot topic right now, but the obesity rate in the U.S. is soaring, with major companies branding chemicals and preservatives as healthy for our children, lending to diseases such as prediabetes, which I was diagnosed as in my sophomore year. How do you intend to address and combat this issue as President of the United States? Uh, first of all, um, thank you for the question. I'll tell you. We have something called the Farm Bill. We do it every five years. And it is, it is the root, no pun intended, of everything that could be so great in this country and also so terrible. Because it, all it is is billions and billions of dollars of incentives for farmers. So what happens if you, if you give farmers incentives only to grow corn, for example, they grow a bunch of corn, it's subsidized, then all the big food companies, all of the big food companies, they want to use the least expensive food inputs, ingredients than they, that they possibly can. So corn, it makes corn syrup, it's an artificial syrup, it's a sweetener, right? They're using ingredients that are subsidized that for the most part are not good for us. So how do we, the answer to the question is, let's get real. We should be investing in American health. You know that our life expectancy is declining in this country? Obesity rates are rising, diseases of despair climbing, opioid addiction rampant, and we don't have a mental health system or emotional health system. We don't look at addiction as a health issue, we look at it as a criminal issue, and we subsidize the very terrible ingredients that are making people ill. I'm different. I don't care what the politics say, I don't care what the parties say. Let's follow the facts, follow the data, reform the farm bill to give incentives to farmers to grow food that actually keep people healthier, right, fitter, and live more wonderful lives. And that's what we should be doing. And then we may have to make sure that those things are available in every community in this country, rural areas, urban areas, suburban areas, right? I think that's, I hope that's where you're leading me, right? Good. Well, thank you. I didn't even know your question or answer, but that's exactly what we got to do. And nobody's telling you the truth. You know why this happens on the farm bill? It's the same thing as pharma. I'm going to close with this and we're going to tell you a story. The reason that we pay 100% more than any country in the world for our pharmaceuticals is we allow the pharma industry to bring $300 million a year to Washington, share it with their lobbying team, and then put all that money in the pockets of candidates, saying something really simple. Eh, just maintain the status quo. That's all we're asking. 
Well, that's what we do. Why would members of Congress ever allow them to do that to us, knowing that it costs all of us $250 billion a year? Think about the nonsense. What happens in the Farm Bill? Same thing. Lobbyists get their money in the pockets of the Ag Committee members, and they lead them down a path that benefits many of these huge corporations that want to maintain the status quo. So back to your question, Chris, to so many of the others, I'm going to tell you the truth. It does not make me popular, but that's not what matters. Because as long as I got all of you to help me out, they can't do anything about it when I'm in that White House and I tell the truth and I expose them for what they're doing. And no longer can they do that to me or to this Congress because we will know what's really happening. That's how I'm going to lead you all. So let me end with this. I do this series at home called Common Ground, you see, because I have this belief in like what I did last night with those Trumpers waiting in line in the cold going to the Trump rally, that if you simply go up to somebody and look them in the eye and shake their hand, maybe even give them a hug or a high five, that a lot can change. So I do something where we gather six Democrats and six Republicans at a table, and it's facilitated by a group called Braver Angels. You all know them? Any of you? Look them up. They're amazing. Democrats and Republicans from all, all around the country simply getting people together. So we talk about our backgrounds. We talk about health care, immigration, and national division. And at the end of these gatherings, after some food, we take 30 seconds and go around the table and share what we got from this experience. Not long ago, we had this wonderful moment where a young woman named Emily looks across the table at Dave. says, Dave, when you pulled up next to me in the parking lot in your F-150 with the Trump sticker... I almost got back in my car, left the parking lot, and went home. I could barely get myself to come in the building, let alone sit at a table with you. And then she smiled and says, you know what, though, Dave? I've never sat with a Trumper, and I kind of like you. And Dave smiles, goes around the table, gets to Dave. He looks at Emily. He says, Emily, when you drove up in your Prius, I wanted to run it over. And he says... But I'm glad I didn't because I've never sat with a liberal before and I had no idea how much common ground we had. And at that moment, the dyed-in-the-wool Trumper, the bleeding-heart liberal, on their own accord, they stood up in front of our table and they hugged, they embraced. And i got to tell you, like I said earlier, I don't know if this comes to an end in November, my whole career in public service, or goes four or eight years. But either way, I achieved the very success that I started out on the very first day I decided to run for Congress, to demonstrate that we can do it. So when I'm your president, by the way, my birthday is January 20th, and that happens to be Inauguration Day. That would be a heck of a gift next year. Right? <laughs> and I promise you, people, now people say all the time, so what will you do on the first day in the White House? Well, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to plan my first common ground dinner, where we bring Democrats and Republicans from all around the country to sit in the White House, not in tuxedos, in jeans, hanging out with their president, me, getting to know each other, telling a little about ourselves, and having a little convo, because I intend to lead that way. And you know, everybody that does that, they're going to go back home to Topeka, right, or Boise, or New York City, or San Francisco, and maybe do the same thing. Get a few people around the table, and we're going to start repairing this country one handshake, one high five, and one hug at a time. And that's my request to all of you. You ready for change? You ready for some decency? You ready for a president who's not going to demean half of this country or ignore the other half? I might be your guy, but here's my request. There are enough of you in this room tonight that if we all, you all go home and send either 10 people a note, post something on Facebook, Instagram. For some of you older folks in the room, there's this thing called TikTok or Snapchat. You know what I'm talking about. If you do that, and tomorrow night we shock the world in some way, shape, or form, you will have participated in the greatest act of American patriotism that this country may have ever known. Because nobody believes we can do it. Most of the polls say we're only at 7%. Let me tell you, I'm going to give you a little spin on a secret. We're going to do better than that. <laughs> Under promise, over deliver. That's my request of all of you. And then... This is just going to begin, and then I want you to join me somewhere else. Come along on the road. Get to know this amazing country. Get to know the people I'm meeting, and let's help do this together. Because when I'm in the White House, you are my family, and I hope I'm part of yours. I love you, Manchester. I love you, New Hampshire. I love you, Granite State. And my goodness, my friends, 
Let's shock the world tomorrow night. Let's do it. Change is coming. We're going to get it. I'm Dean Phillips. I love you all. Boom. Boom. Give it up for Dean Phillips, the next president of the United States. Folks, if you would like a photo or a handshake with Dean, we ask you to line up right here where I'm waving my hand.